Ayça, okay, it's time we can start now. Okay. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our online conference tonight. Uh, before giving the stage to our dear guest, I want to introduce myself. I will be the moderator of today's conference. Uh, my name is Ayça Erşen Danieli. Uh, I am an associate professor in pathology department in Ajibadem University, and I'm working in neuropathology field. Uh, these online education meetings have started with Professor Hasan Kamil Sucu, the program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents. It also continues with the contributions of experts from other universities uh, like me tonight. Uh, all the microphones are going to be turned off during the presentation of uh, the lecturer to avoid voice and uh, noise pollution. Sorry about that. You can ask your questions by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. Uh, and at the end, end of the presentation, all of the questions will be asked to the lecturer and they will be discussed. Uh, mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of these meetings. Uh, Please um, um, be turned off. Uh, uh, please let your microphones to be turned off. And now uh, I would like to introduce our guest, and it's my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Ingmar Blumke. Uh, he is from University Hospital of Erlangen uh, in Germany. Um, he is full professor of neuropathology and the director of the department of neuropathology. And uh, from uh, 2014 to present, he is also consultant in Epilepsy Center Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, United States. Uh, uh, he is the chair of U uh, European Epilepsy Brain Bank and he is uh, in the executive committee of ILAE uh, Europe, uh, and he is the chair of ILAE Education Council. Uh, he has more than 400 articles. Uh, he has uh, about 26,000 citations, and his age index is 87. Welcome again, Professor Van Den, uh, Professor uh, Ingmar Blumke. Uh, now you can start sharing your screen. The screen is yours. Thank you, Aisha, for this kind in invitation and and and and, uh, and presentation. And thank you, Hassan, for for for allowing me to to talk to you tonight. And let me see my my screen is now in presentation mode. Is it? Can you see it? Yes. yes. Wonderful. You can see it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, to have some some time with you and and talk about brain tumors, in particular the ganglioglioma. That that was the topic uh, I was uh, I was given. However, you will see that I will try to broaden the topic uh, towards the uh, the entire spectrum of epilepsy associated uh, brain tumors, uh, in in particular the low grades. Um, I, I see that my, uh, my uh, video is frozen. Can you still hear me and, and yeah, see? We can well? hear you. Your <laughs> picture is frozen. But... Yeah, my picture is frozen. So I don't know if it's better to uh, turn off the video. Uh, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm recording from home. So maybe the, the bandwidth is not, not too, too, too good. But, but anyhow, you tell me when, when it's getting uh, worse. No, no, it's OK. I okay, so, no <laughs> so you have a frozen screen here. That's, <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm working. Uh, sorry, I'm working in the uh, University Hospital in Erlangen. Uh, that that is in Bavaria, in, uh, in in Germany. And one of my uh, my particular research interest is uh, epilepsy associated brain lesions, and and most more recently uh, on the brain tumors. However. Uh, as I should, um, uh, told you, you know, I have a, I have a kind of long track record in, in, on this topic, and and I will try to give you um, an in-depth uh, insight and, and and tour about uh, about all that that that I have gathered uh, uh, on this topic. But but I would like to start with this uh, with this uh, patient um, presentation. 
Uh, here you see this is a T2 image, and I don't know if you have seen uh, any kind of lesion here. It's it's it's it's hard to see. Honestly, it's on the on the uh, right temporal lobe. Um, you see it here, right? There's something, uh, and that that was consistent with the seizure onset. Uh, the patient and and it was resected. Here is a surgical specimen. You see a very nice on block resection, and you also see my mouse, please. Yes, yes. you can see yes. my. Okay, yes. so so you see here uh, the center of the white matter here. This is this uh, white matter rarefaction or little little cyst that is probably most um, consistent with these uh, uh, hyper intensity here. So uh, yeah, it's it's not very easy to understand what kind of lesion that is. And, and many people probably would say, well, this is a lesion, but it, it really is it a tumor or is it FCD or, or what is it? it it's, not, it's not very clear. So, so if, you, if you go on the, on the microscope and then you see there is a, a, a, an increase in cell number and then you can use immunohistochemistry, uh, be published, I think almost uh, 25 years ago that CD34 is a nice marker and now Nowadays, the molecular signature of the BRAF mutation, the V600E mutation is quite evident. So, so uh, in other words, we would have um, called this a ganglioglioma, okay? A BRAF altered, and according to the newest uh, WHO classification scheme, it is CNS WHO grade one. However, uh, that is not very evident that every uh, every lab would come to that conclusion uh, based on the immuno and the H and E, uh, and that particularly is uh, because of the difficulty to identify uh, the, the the neuronal the glial uh, the the the, um, the ganglion cell component, and that is something I want to talk about today a little bit in more detail. Uh, uh, I would say <clears throat> this image. It's quite clear here that these cells probably do not belong to to uh, to uh, to the um, pre-existing uh, uh, neurons of of that of that cortex. However, if if if there's disagreement and and honestly, it's it's not it's not very very crystal clear for every pathologist in the world that how how to judge these cells. They, they may come to a, a different conclusion. Uh, uh, probably that this is a, a diffuse glioma, uh, MAP kinase altered, which is uh, the BRAF, is, is a, a, a, a molecule or a gene in the MAP kinase uh, signaling pathway. Uh, and that, that um, uh, is, a, is a young child here, so that would be a pediatric subtype. And this is a new entity uh, uh, uh, proposed by the by the uh, by the fifth edition of the WHO Blue Book, and and that that that hasn't been really uh, well introduced into the uh, into the uh, uh, into the community yet. And, and this is something I'm I'm I would also like to uh, to uh, draw your attention onto. So so here that should just uh, uh, give us the uh, the roadmap that we have our. Uh, histopathology measures, but that uh, there is disagreement uh, across uh, the country and, and different continents and, and so forth. And that, that's something uh, I'm very concerned with and I wanna tell you about it. Uh, this is another uh, patient here I wanna present as a, as a start. Uh, this is a, an older patient. I think uh, at time of the first surgery, this lady was already in her 40s. So pro probably, I think she was 40s six or 47. Unfortunately, I do not have the MRI uh, to show. However, uh, the MRI was very consistent with, uh, with uh, hippocampal atrophy. And, and that was, uh, uh, the hypothesis was hippocampal sclerosis. And, and uh, she got a very um, restricted resection of the hippocampal head at that time. Uh, but we, we, we found these, uh, these uh, increased cell density, again, the CD34 uh, labeling, which is very uncommon in normal brain, in particular in the hippocampus, and very few uh, labeling uh, uh, uh, nuclei, so, so proliferative uh, nuclei, labeled here with the TI67 uh, epitope. So um, 
We also called this a ganglioglioma, or uh, WHO grade one. However, uh, two years later, uh, the lady came back. She, she, she didn't become seizure free, I, I have to say. And, and we all agreed that this was because of the limited resection in the first place. That, that was, she, she, uh, the hippocampus wasn't taken out completely. So, so here you see now the dente gyrus. So, so they, are, they started to, uh, um, to, uh, uh, to complete the hippocampal resection. And we could still see this CD34 um, infiltration, however, was very cell, uh, cell poor. It was not a very cellular uh, lesion. However, uh, based on our experience, uh, we, we still called that a tumor. It was not hippocampus growth, it was a tumor infiltrating the hippocampus, and also some atypical neurons here you see on that map to staining. But that wasn't the end of this story at all. So um, that was temporal lobe, of course, temp uh, the hippocampus on the left side. And then she had a, uh, a, a, third le a, a, a second lesion on the frontal lobe. That was also, I think, only two years later. And this is now, uh, frankly, that is a malignant tumor. You see here on H and E are the cell density. So if you read an H and E, the blue stain, so the hematoxylene that stains the, the nuclei. And you see here uh, lots of nuclei, very, very bluish, very, very little red in between. So a highly um, uh, um, uh, cellular tumor and the asterisk here showed to, uh, to uh, my mitosis, so a proliferative tumor. Again, it was CD34 positive. It has also some neuronal components. Uh, the ki 67 was now uh, very, uh, very uh, dense, uh, uh, above 10%. Uh, ATRX, another tumor marker was, uh, was retained, but IDH1 was a negative. So, so IDH1, the, the, um, the hotspot mutation, the IDH1 gene is also very important. If that is, uh, if that is wild type, we ought to call this tumor uh, a, a glioblastoma, I have to say. However, at that time, and this is now retrospect, we called it anaplastic ganglioglioma, BRAF wild type, was not, no BRAF mutation uh, and IDH1 uh, wild type as well. Um, however, uh, we, we are not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, the WHO uh, has abandoned uh, uh, the term of anaplastic ganglioglioma. And as I said, uh, with the um, aid of the, uh, of the molecular genetics, we, we are now obliged to call it glioblastoma, IDH uh, wild type CNS WHO grade four. Uh, that that is a uh, that is intriguing. Uh, it's it's a completely different therapy, you know. I mean, the patient is still living. I mean, she re uh, she she uh, escaped our attention, uh, so to speak, uh, because of of all these uh, these uh, these uh, these drama. But but she's still alive, so it's it's not working like a glioblastoma. However. Um, this is just a case, you know, to open up and to give you a clear overview why this this topic is so so important and and also are uh, necessary to discuss. And uh, you may have heard about the um, uh, DNA methylation. This is uh, now very much um, uh, uh, uh, uh, fostered by the WHO. Uh, you you use a, a methylation classifier. And, and that would also um, argue for glioblastoma in that case, although uh, it's, it's not a very high um, uh, calibration score. So um, yeah, so, so this is my today's roadmap. I wanna, I wanna uh, briefly uh, come to the spectrum of ganglioglioma uh, in, and the, uh, in the spectrum of long-term or low-grade developmental epilepsy-associated tumors, so, so the LEAD. Then uh, what well, the, the uses of molecular diagnostics in helping us to, uh, to differentiate and, and uh, uh, define these, uh, these tumor types. And then uh, with the new edition of the WHO, we have, uh, we have um, uh, learned about very new entities that have not even been uh, yet uh, introduced into clinical practice. Okay, so so I think this is the first presentation that that you may may recognize or how you recognize uh, the patient or the brain tumor, and I, I think this is 
uh, pretty clear here. These um, these polycystic lesion. You probably most of you will uh, will uh, agree that this is like a, a dysembryoblastic neuroepithelial tumor. And on this side here, with the uh, with the cystic lesion and the nodule, uh, the peri. Uh, uh, uh, uh, this is uh, nodule uh, is probably a ganglioma. At least it, it's from the WHO blue book. However, uh, the spectrum, the MRI spectrum, of these tumors is is quite quite um, a huge. And on this flare, you see here this hyperintensity uh, with some some nodules here. That, that's very difficult. And, and, and however, this is also a, a, a tumor from the spectrum, uh, it's a ganglioglioma. Mm -hmm. and, and here you have another lesion and that's probably something else. That's probably a, a, a, an astrocytoma, low-grade astrocytoma. However, um, what, what I just wanna say that this, uh, the MRI diagnosis is not, is not very, very, um, uh, uh, um, Reliable. So many people, based on different on their different experience, would probably uh, call these uh, these lesions differently. Uh, so it, it has to come down to the pathology report to, to clarify, and and that is one of the take home messages of today that the, the pathology report is is not so well um, is not so well. Uh, um, aligned across the different laboratories. Uh, that, that is something I wanna show you again and again, and I just I need you to understand that this is, uh, is in certain ways uh, is a trouble because uh, we, we have, uh, we still lack behind a lot of knowledge that, that other tumor entities has gained because they have uh, much clearer uh, definitions and, uh, and yeah, and uh, protocols. So um, that is one of our uh, large brain bank series, uh, a total of uh, almost 1,680 cases, 80% of them belong into the layered spectrum and they are all from epilepsy surgery, okay? Um, and you see here that the ganglioglioma is uh, the most frequent one. It's almost 50% of the entire series. And then followed by the uh, dysembryoblastic neuroepithelial tumor, pilocytic uh, uh, astrocytoma, and then other low-grade neuroepithelial tumors, not otherwise specified than the isomorphic diffuse glioma, amniocentric glioma, and then the multivacular uh, nodulated tumor, and then papillary glioneuronal tumors as an example. And I'm also telling you that this list is increasing and increasing, and, and we are uh, we are. This is causing more more trouble than than doing good in in my personal belief. However, in these uh, epilepsy surgery series, the majority of these uh, tumors belong to the layer. So eighty percent, more than eighty percent of these patients probably go into that. And you see here, these are the uh, uh, early onset disease uh, uh, patients compared to the non layered group with the uh, pleomorphics. The oligos, the astros, the meningiomas, and others, they are much older, right? That, that's much clearer. And also the, uh, uh, the temporal, uh, the uh, location of the temporal lobe is much more common here in the layered group compared to the non layered group. Okay, so uh, this is our, our cohort. Uh, yeah, and, and we are, uh, this, this uh, is uh, an, a nice paper where we almost, uh, where we had the opportunity to uh, review almost 10,000 specimens. And you see here, the ganglioglioma is a second, a second place in adults. Uh, and then also the DNET is in the top 10 uh, of the adults. And the same is true for the, uh, for the children. Ganglioglioma here is on third place and the DNET is on, uh, on fourth. So this is um, uh, just for you to, uh, to recognize that this is kind of a common scenario in epilepsy surgery. And that is a, a second study we did from the, uh, from the European Epilepsy Brain Bank where we look in particular to the outcome to understand what is the predictive uh, mode of the histopathology diagnosis. And you see here, particularly in children, but to some extent also in, in the adults, uh, the tumor here in dark blue are, are those lesions with the best uh, predictive value. So proportion of patients are being seizure-free and drug-free. 
for more than five years. So in other words, this is, they are cured, right? They're five years seizure free and drug free. And this is something very remarkable uh, considering that epilepsy still is a chronic disease. It's, it's, it's often difficult to treat. So, so people go to surgery as the, as the last resort. And then to, to, uh, to learn that, that if you have these, uh, these different uh, etiologies here that you can, that you can achieve uh, a cure in 50% of the patient, this is uh, truly remarkable. So in other words, uh, we want to understand uh, why, why are still some failures, failures here, right? This is something we are, we are, uh, we want to know since this is uh, per se such a good group, uh, such a, a good prediction group uh, that, that we need to understand why, why still uh, some of these uh, lesions are not, or the patients are not seizure free after surgery. So, so th this is what I'm saying. This is a little bit beyond academics now, right? This is really what what we what we need to understand, and we we need to uh, to uh, get a sense of uh, what's going on. What what kind of tumor is it that that probably do not behave very well? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you that that solution uh, this evening. But but this is just to to give you my mindset that that that's uh, that's. Uh, uh, the uh, the motivation for us to to look into that in more detail. So let me see why this is frozen. Okay, so um, so you see there is um, an opportunity to uh, to add the uh, histopathology. Uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, definition or, or diagnosis with a, a layer of molecular diagnosis. This is uh, now pretty common in, in uh, all the malignant tumors, the gliomas, the embryonal tumors, even the ependymomas, the meningiomas, and so forth. Um, with, in the spectrum of ganglioglioma layer, we, we lag a little bit behind. However, there are some some interesting uh, associations like this pol uh, papillary glioneuronal tumor. They all have a a fusion or uh, uh, molecular alteration in the uh, uh, protein kinase C gene. The same is true for the DNET. So the majority of them shown alteration, uh, either a fusion or duplication or mutation in the FGFR1 gene. Um, uh, however, that's that's um, that's. Um, uh, that that is the rule, and and and and and and, and published literature uh, also uh, show other other tumors or other DNAs that do not show this. But however, I think more than eighty percent probably follow that rule. The same is true with the ganglioglioma. Uh, so the majority of them show this BRAF six hundred E mutation, um, and that is uh, quite clear here. Also, we have a surrogate marker, the CD thirty four. The DNA have a p16 uh, increase, and the PGNT is they have this this signed up to physine label here, and then you, we have the angiocentric glioma. These are uh, in the spectrum. We have the uh, MIP alteration, and then uh, we have the isomorphic or diffuse glioma. They have also this MIP alteration. So uh, these are the, the the majority of these tumors already have a kind of a genotype phenotype association, uh, and that would probably uh, help a lot and uh, in order to to uh, further stratify it. But, but you see now this is kind of a uh, step back in in in the uh, in the. Um, uh, uh, in, in the story where we where we are uh, looked uh, into um, published case series from different uh, centers and different countries around the world, a total of two thousand patients were reported in these seven uh, seven papers, and that was truly before the uh, the era of molecular genetics. Uh, but then you see here that the uh, that the two centers from the United States. They certainly had the the highest percentage of glial tumors in their case series. Uh, the centers from uh, from uh, France and UK uh, had the highest uh, percentage of DNets in their case series uh, compared to glial tumors. And then we had the uh, the German and and Chinese group. We had the highest 
a percentage of gangliogliomas uh, compared to, to these numbers here. And uh, overall, I think we will all agree that, that we talk probably about the same tumors, uh, the same case series. These are all epilepsy surgery. Uh, case series, uh, and uh, there is no, no indication whatsoever that there are ethnical differences. So what I'm just saying is that it depends rather from the center and the, uh, and the schools, they, they, they trained and they learned whether they, uh, they define uh, one of these uh, epilepsy associated uh, uh, developmental brain tumors as a glial or glioma as a DNET or as a ganglio, right? So, so that is something that, that really are, is of, of concern for us. And uh, this is a, a, a picture back from, uh, from 2015. This was the uh, pre-pandemic old normal when we were all allowed uh, to sit together on the microscope. Uh, and, and reviewing the slides. This is how we are tried to uh, figure out the agreement across uh, across our um, our uh, um, our uh, yeah the, the the agreement across our laboratories and countries and and so forth. And here, this nice lady, she's from Ankara in in Turkey. Um, and, and you see what we did, we had 30 cases, they were kind of consecutively collected, 180 slides, uh, and we invited uh, 25 participants, 18 countries, but that, this is now, sorry, I, I have to say, uh, then we, we put that uh, onto a, a virtual, virtual microscopy platform because it's too expensive and it's, it's just not, not possible to bring together all people on, on one microscope. Uh, that was all already, you know, before, before the uh, COVID pandemic in 2019, we published that. Uh, and and uh, uh, we asked everybody to, uh, to look into the slides and tell us uh, what, what their diagnosis uh, would be. And, and we allowed them you know, access to H&E staining and a number of immuno uh, stainings, such as you know, the glial fibrillary acidic protein, it's a gliomarker, uh, uh, microtubule associated protein two. That's a that's a neuronal marker. Another neuronal marker. This is a CD34 marker and uh, the proliferation marker. So uh, the the question is now how many how much agreement did we reach in this in this cohort? Uh, I'm telling you this is now a very uh, astonishing. Uh, there was only 40 percent agreement on individual uh, tumors. So, so this is why I'm telling you our neuropathology, histopathology is, is, uh, is a kind of a gold standard in, in diagnoses, but when it comes down to certain, to certain are difficult to classify entities such as these epilepsy tumors, it's, it's very hard to tell our, um, that, that one diagnosis would read the same across different laboratories. And, and uh, what was bothersome was also that the WHO grading was inconsistent across them. That was from one to three in, in one single case. And, and you know better than me that this is this having a, a lot of consequences. If you judge uh, the WHO grade being uh, grade three or anaplastic or being grade one, right? Okay, so so so with the uh, with the uh, advancement in in molecular genetics, uh, we have now a, a number of genes that can be uh, linked to these tumor entities. And interesting, uh, the majority of of them in, in the tumor field belong to the RAS-RAF MAP kinase signaling. Here with the FGF receptor, you see here already. This uh, is for the DNATs. Then we have here the uh, the BRAF. And, and other genes, uh, and and that is tightly linked to the uh, uh, mTOR signaling pathway that is uh, very frequent in the uh, FCD uh, area, right? So, and then the GATOR is also this is the FCD, and that is the uh, the layered spectrum. So very close, and. Um, in other words, you know, we are these these pathways are are probably those who are responsible for the lesion for the for the pathogenesis, uh, and then it's uh, the matter of fact that uh, that these uh, genetic uh, lesions are acquired during the uh, um, are during the development of, of uh, the brain when the neuroblasts and glioblasts 
still grow. Um, and the, the earlier uh, the, the genetic mutation is acquired in that, uh, then the mosaicism that, that, that, that takes place, uh, the lesion is getting uh, larger, or if it's you know, uh, acquired later, then the lesion is smaller. In, in other words, so here the tumor would be smaller or the FCD would be smaller, but, but they share probably the very same developmental background. So in other words, it's the gene that is responsible for uh, to determine whether it's a tumor or a, a dysplasia. And then, uh, so, so, so the pathway, and what we also figure out that here is more prevalent in the temporal lobe. So this pathway here is affected more in the te temporal lobe, whereas um, the FCDs are much more uh, uh, prevalent uh, in the uh, frontal lobe. Okay, so um, uh, and and when we when we started or uh, uh, when we had this uh, this agreement study, I I just uh, uh, I just. Uh, uh, uh, introduced to you in, in 2015, that was published in 2019. We already had access to uh, to the DNA methylation uh, uh, um, uh, technology, and interestingly, there were only two major groups of of uh, tumors uh, based on the uh, DNA methylation uh, that were the the DNet cohort and the ganglioma cohort. And, and you see here, these were all the, the different uh, terminologies that the group tried to discuss and to resolve in order to make the diagnosis more, more agreeable. So we not only had here the uh, ganglioglioma or DNet, but we had a diffuse glioneuronal tumor. We had um, uh, uh, the, the neuronal tumor not otherwise specified and and so forth and and that that doesn't doesn't uh, play out for the uh, for the genomic or DNA methylation uh, stratification and heat map so the the classifier would recognize either it's a DNet and then it was CD34 negative and it was uh, uh, most of the cases where FGFR1 mutated or it was a ganglioglioma that was CD34 positive and was BRAF mutated. Um, and that is, uh, that is uh, interesting if you, if you can uh, implement this into the field. Um, this is here a nice, uh, a nice um, uh, uh, picture from, uh, from a cancer cell. Uh, you are for, for some of you might recognize this year as the Berlin Wall. Uh, that that was teared down in 1989 in West Berlin, uh, parting from from East Berlin. But you see that this is the optical wall they called it. The, hypothetically, the optical wall that that is teared down by the advancement of genetics. So, so in other words, we were all know for a long time that microscopic diagnosis per se and and uh, standalone has some limitations, in particular in terms of agreement, but if you that then add a level, a layer of molecular or objectifiable molecular information, uh, you you may reach a much higher agreement uh, across uh, across uh, the uh, the uh, reviewers. Um, and and that was our hope. And then this is here a picture taken from the fifth edition of the uh, WHO Blue Book. But uh, in, in the field of the glioneuronal and neuronal tumors where the ganglioglioma is located, the opposite is likely to take place. So we see uh, an increase of uh, entities now that are hardly pronounceable. Uh, I don't know if you have ever heard about the diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma-like features and nuclear clusters. I haven't seen it myself. I never did. And also the diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor or so is, is a, a, a very rare, or I, I don't, it's, it's an entity. It has been published because uh, people found uh, there is a histopathology pattern that matches with a certain molecular phenotype. And that phenotype can be, however, can also be the BRAF 
or it can be the FGFR1 that has been already uh, allocated more or less to the well-known categories of the ganglioglioma and the DNet. But now we have uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, new entities and I will come to this chapter right now and uh, I hope I can, I can make myself clear enough that this is of concern, uh, that, that we do not understand well how to uh, use this terminology in the years to come. Uh, look here, this is from the fifth edition, uh, and this is here now about the uh, glioma, the diffuse glioma, which is uh, in the field of brain tumors, uh, diffuse glioma has a stigma to my understanding that patients would probably feel a little bit worried if their diagnosis is a diffuse glioma. But then you see here, uh, this is a diffuse astrocytoma that we described uh, in the beginning of 2000, uh, 2000, when was it? 2002 or 2004. We called it the uh, isomorphic uh, astrocytoma MIP altered. Now it's, it's, it's for the first time it's in the WHO, but it's, uh, it's now a diffuse astrocytoma. They have just changed the terminology. The angiocentric glioma, it's also a low-grade tumor. And then we have the diffuse glioma, MAP kinase uh, pathway altered. This is a new term. Uh, I'm, uh, we haven't read this in the, uh, in the uh, literature uh, a lot. And uh, honestly, these are also patients with, uh, with early onset uh, epilepsy and the temporal lobe tumors. And then here, the um, pleomorphic, low-grade neuropathelia tumor of the young, the plenty, that has been also uh, described a couple of years ago. So we have uh, a lot of these are uh, these um, uh, new entities here, and you see the BRAF mutation is here, the BRAF mutation is here, FGFR1 is here, FGFR1 or 2 is here. So we thought that is clearly associated with the DNA, that is rather with the ganglio and so forth, but well, are, we lost this opportunity to clarify, and now we are in, in a dilemma, right? We have we have the uh, histopathology patterns; they are not well described, and they are very subjective. Then we have the molecular data, which is less subjective, but now it's allowed to associate with many different uh, entities. Uh, and I want to I want to go into some details here with the Plan T. Um, this is here from the uh, original uh, uh, publication in 2017 from Jason Hughes, uh, I think uh, from the United States. Uh, and you see here are uh, these, these images are from, uh, from our two 2002. So it's, it's uh, almost 15 years before we defined this as uh, ganglioglioma subtypes, uh, all with the uh, CD34. And interestingly, here the Americans they learned that CD34 is a nice marker. So it's like you know they discovered that for the very first time that CD34 is a marker for these tumors, and they found uh, uh, a novel entity. So you know all these different things uh, we described 15 years ago, and now we have this new entity here, and we don't know how to differentiate these tumors from from from ganglioglioma. Honestly, it's it's almost impossible. And this is something. Uh, uh, also of concern, the pediatric type diffuse glioma, MAP kinase altered. Uh, this is from Katerina Giannini's uh, uh, figures, and I talked to her uh, many times. She was also visiting me in Erlangen a couple of months ago, and we are still not, not sure how we can disentangle. Uh, in this picture, you see some neurons right here. These are neurons. So uh, in other words, we would call this uh, uh, a, a ganglioglioma probably, and they call it now a pediatric type diffuse glioma. And this comes from this uh, cancer cell paper from uh, Cynthia Hawkins group in, in, in, uh, in Toronto, um, where, where, they, uh, where they coined this term pediatric low-grade gliomas. Uh, and, and they are indeed, uh, the majority of these patients have epilepsy. They are, they are children or young adults. Uh, but we don't know anything about CD34. This hasn't been even studied here. So yeah, uh, I'm trying to give you, you know, a flavor of of the of the trouble we are we are running in with with all these new entities that are differently defined by different people. Okay, 
So uh, coming, coming close to the end, uh, there is always some light at the end of the tunnel. However, we will see if this is helpful or not. Uh, there are, are now two papers, and I'm referring to this from 2018 from a uh, Korean group of uh, uh, Jean Ho Lee, uh, published in Nature, Nature Medicine. What they did, they electroporated the brain of, of our developing mice with the BRAF V600 E mutation. Uh, this is a little bit differently called because the mouse uh, gene is, has a different terminology. However, it's exactly the same mutation that we see in our human uh, uh, brain tumors and the gangliomas. And all of these animals are developed tumors and also uh, seizures. They, they studied that very, very clear. Uh, interestingly, all the uh, tumors also expressed CD34. Uh, and then they came to the conclusion that uh, this is a, a ganglioglioma with um, the uh, BRAF insertion into uh, the uh, neurons. They make them dysplastic and epileptogenic. And if the BRAF was inserted into the glial component, they make it the, uh, uh, the neoplastic uh, cell uh, uh, uh, enrichment, so the tumor genesis. And, and this is a... Um, a hypothesis that, that is uh, in the literature for, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, um, histogenesis of, uh, of uh, ganglioglioma for at least 30 or 40 years. And, and we published this also in 2002 in the, in the one review that I showed you in a previous slide. So that, that you have the one mutation, it affects the neuron that is the, uh, the component that gives the epileptogenic uh, trigger uh, but it's it's certainly not the, the component that makes the tumor grow because neurons are fast mitotic uh, per, per definition. And then we have the glial cells. They are still, they can proliferate and they make the tumor uh, and they can even uh, um, uh, uh, uh, malignetize, malignetize. So I think this is a very nice uh, model, an animal model that supports the association of the BRAF V600E uh, mutation with the ganglioglioma uh, that, uh, and that CD34 is a very nice surrogate of it. And honestly, this is what our data shows all the time that this is the case. So um, I will come to the conclusion here that um, uh, well, in the ganglioglioma and all of the other layers, uh, the uh, brain somatic mosaicism of MAP kinase signaling pathway genes uh, play a major role. Uh, that, is B, uh, that is either the BRAF or the, B, uh, uh, uh, the FGF uh, receptor one gene or, or some other uh, partners of, of this RAS-RAF MAP kinase signaling. And this is in contrast, clearly in contrast to mTOR that is uh, linked with the FCDs. Uh, and I still believe that uh, integration of genotype phenotype analysis is uh, is very important. Uh, it will help uh, in in diagnostic accuracy, and then also, of course, uh, for personalized medicine. If we have new new new drug targets, like you know uh, the BRAF, uh, this is uh, this is nice uh, to have. There are, there are drugs in the shelf already. So if, if, if, uh, if surgery fails, we can use probably some of these, um, these uh, receptor antagonists to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, silence the, the pathway. But, but uh, this, is, uh, this has to go hand in hand and we need really a, a better validation of clinically meaningful entities. So uh, the moment it's like, you know, you publish a new case, uh, uh, uh, you have like two or three uh, similar histopathology patterns on the microscope and then you find a gene X, Y, Z, and then you try to make it a, a different entity. And, and, and I don't think personally we are, we will be uh, very lucky with this strategy in the, in the long run. Uh, we, we should rather, um, be, uh, be uh, mindful and and uh, read all the, the available literature and trying to to figure out which of these are uh, these um, tumors are uh, more or less of the uh, 
uh, uh, adverse outcome fraction. So you see in the beginning what I told you, what I showed you, the, the one case that we cannot, that we cannot easily um, uh, uh, diagnose according to all these, all these uh, measures that, that we have at the moment. So we miss an important issue here. And the WHO is not, is, uh, was not very helpful in the, with the fifth edition and the, uh, the, uh, that, that they even stopped uh, the grading uh, beyond uh, WHO grade one. So we don't have atypic, we don't have anaplastic variants. Now it's either a ganglio grade one or it's a glioblastoma and, and that doesn't make sense. Uh, to me at all. Good, um, uh, I'm coming to the end now. So yes, I should told you that, that uh, the International League Against Epilepsy is, uh, has uh, developed a very useful tool, the uh, uh, ILE Academy. If you want to learn more in epileptology, these are uh, like case-based uh, e-learning modules that you can go through. This is a uh, uh, layer one, uh, level one for beginners to level two now for uh, for proficiency levels. Uh, a very uh, very carefully developed uh, uh, state of the art e-learning uh, that might be of interest for you if you are, are seeking for more teaching and education in epileptology. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumke. Uh, it was a great talk and um, you really highlighted our confusions about this, um, the most recent classification of WHO. And um, <clears throat> so the, uh, we will be uh, taking the questions, but for, first of all, I want to uh, ask a few questions. Um, so uh, it was great to see uh, that you are also in the same opinion with most of us that uh, Plan T is almost the same with uh, ganglioglioma. But one of them is under the uh, pediatric type, diffuse low-grade glioma uh, group, and the other one is in the glioneuronal uh, tumor group. So it looks like it's more rational to put all of the epilepsy-associated tumors under the category of probably something like, as you always say, low-grade epilepsy-associated neuroepithelial tumors, because we are not sure uh, which of them are really glioneuronal and which of them are really only glial, and is there any gangliocytoma? Uh, so um, this is my comment, uh, but also I want to say I have seen two suspicious cases for diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendral glial-like features and nuclear clusters. But uh, the uh, WHO essential criteria is the methylation profile. <laughs> so um, I uh, looked at all of the literature. The uh, morphology was the same. The uh, radiology was very similar. The clinical features were very similar, but I was not uh, allowed to give the diagnosis of this uh, tumor type because we do not have methylation um, platform in uh, Turkey, unfortunately. So, uh, and the patient didn't have money and he couldn't pay for the methylation profiling. So mm. with my colleagues, we collected money. We sent the tissue to uh, Germany for methylation analysis. We got the result as this, um, diffuse glioneuronal with oligo-like features and nuclear clusters. And so we were able to put the diagnosis correctly. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's um, rational. Uh, my question, <clears throat> so um, many of the clinicians are using BRAF inhibitors for these um, uh, gangliogliomas now. And uh, most of the um, medical oncologists, especially pediatricians, uh, say that after stopping uh, BRAF inhibitors, the, tumors, uh, the tumor comes back again in a while, mm -hmm. and it comes back uh, more aggressively. So I have seen only a few cases um, uh, that recurred in time, and uh, the patient received BRAF inhibitors uh, in meanwhile, and I saw only a mild increased mitotic activity, no vascular proliferation, no necrosis, 
uh, still was BRF mutant, still was CD34 uh, positive. So do you have any ex experience with these uh, cases? Uh, so how do you see them? Because radiologically and clinically, they look more aggressive. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, to answer your question directly, no. No, I don't have uh, uh, much of experience and I think nobody has that. It's, it's kind of, you know, a, a single case here and there. Uh, and then they are published and, and from the publications, one might get the impression that this is a helpful strategy. And I think we, we should probably listen careful to uh, all these observations uh, uh, that, that, that you shared now. Uh, and the same was with the, uh, I think, uh, if I remember well, the, the, the Everolimos uh, studies with the SEGAs, with the sub uh, giant cell astrocytoma was a similar observation. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to give the Everolimos uh, all the time. And once they stopped, the tumors kind of, you know, boff, exploded. And we have no understanding why that is so. Uh, it's, it's worrisome. Uh, I think we are in the very beginning of these studies and we may, you know, think of other, other um, uh, molecules or, or maybe giving even a, a more a, a cocktail of, of various things. And the other thing is that, that once we, are, we find the BRAF mutation, we ought to be happy say, okay, this is a classical one. And then uh, if you go through a full exome sequencing, or, or, or genotyping, you may find even more aberrations. And we have no sense yet what that means uh, to, uh, to our patient and, and to the tumor behavior. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, we, are, we, are, yeah, we are in the beginning. I still believe that there is lots of uh, things to learn, but the, the problem here is the, the, the, the few numbers of tumors we have in our individual centers. So this is, I think, a prototype of uh, how, we, uh, how, we need to, uh, how we need to organize our larger networks across Europe. Uh, that, that is absolutely necessary here to have uh, enough patients together uh, and, and, and, and observe them in a, in a certain uh, structured a structured um, uh, uh, way and, and system to uh, come to some uh, helpful conclusions. Uh, at this time, when when when one patient is there, uh, the other is far away, and and we we don't know if what what was you know the the full extent of the genetic lesion and what was the full extent of uh, the the patient history and and other antiepileptic drugs and so forth. So yeah, that, that's basically my, my point. We are, yeah, we, we have to listen careful, but we, we are just too, uh, too early uh, on, that, on that route. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have some questions. Hi, uh, first... with your permission. Uh, ah, yeah. Professor Blumke, please, uh, could you stop your screen sharing? Uh, we can see of course. it's bigger. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So Pnar Chakmak, she is a pathologist and she is now in Germany and she is asking, do you have the methylation results uh, of the previous two biopsies of the patient uh, you presented in the beginning of your presentation? Yeah, this is why I, I kept the, <laughs> kept the, I, I saw it. Yeah, uh, let me see, probably, oh, maybe let me see, I can, can jump. Yeah, yeah, uh, if, the, if I understand correct, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that was the uh, this this one this one uh, case. I think I was uh, uh, how to do that now. Wait, uh, that everybody is on track with this. I think this was here, right? This was this yes. case. Yes. Uh, yeah, we have this, and uh, I didn't show, but uh, this was called uh, a ganglioblioma, and yes. this also. So in other words, we have here, we have three or four DNA methylation profiles of this patient. And this was uh, a ganglioblioma and that was also reminiscent with, uh, with our histology uh, diagnosis. So yeah, it, it wouldn't have helped, but uh, well, still the, the DNA methylation uh, profiling has also its, uh, its drawbacks. Uh, um, in particular, when it comes to the low grade uh, tumors, it has been, it is very strong with the high grade tumors, with the glioblastomas, the uh, oligos, the astros. It was very helpful um, 
uh, based on you know it's it's uh, the prediction of IDH1 uh, mutation or wild type is is very strong. Um, also, you know that that it it allows you know or it it it, it led to the to the conclusion that we do not have really a mixed oligoastroglioma. We have now either an astro with uh, uh, um, uh, retention or we uh, loss, uh, loss, sorry, uh, or we have the oligo with the one P19Q codeletion. Uh, and, and you see how, how, how long we, we fought that fight in the, in the, uh, in the community uh, about this mixed oligoastros and so forth. And, and now, it helped, and it you know these these entities were you know solved, and and now we have a clearer pattern. But it's not we are not there yet uh, with the low grade uh, glioneuronal tumors. And I agree fully with your with when when you said in the beginning, you know why why we shouldn't call them you know low grade glioneuronal or neuroepithelial tumor. Neuroepithelial tumor I think is a is a wonderful term because it does not require that we have to uh, you know flip the coin on every cell whether it's glial or neuronal and honestly that that is often very time consuming and just not helpful and, and the agreement uh, across uh, across our community is very low so yeah that that is exactly the point and the dna methylation classifier has has, has no strong database uh, on these low grades uh, they they recruited most of their patients from these European um, um, uh, tumor cohorts, the ERTS uh, studies, uh, and that was on glioma or the medulloblastomas or the uh, the uh, ependymoma. So they're very strong there because they have a very robust clinical data presentation. They know exactly what happened to the patients. But all of the uh, data that was included in the in the famous uh, Nature paper by David Kapper. On the low grades, he has no idea what the patients had. Is basically they just have had the uh, the paraffin sections and the annotation from whoever new pathologist they sent in. So, and as as I showed you, the agreement is very low. So, in other words, the whole sector of low grade um, low grade tumors is very weak in the uh, in the uh, Heidelberg classifier. Uh, and the other point here is that. Uh, uh, these low-grade tumors have a lower cell uh, density, uh, you know, cell content. And, and in other words, you have a lot of admixture with normal cells, and that could also obscure the, uh, uh, the results. So you need to have a very precise microdissection or so to enrich the tumor cells if in your DNA probe, and, and that is often very difficult to obtain. So, so I, I hear or I know from, from many people using the Heidelberg classifier for DNA methylation on their low-grade tumors, and the classifiers say this is normal brain. It's just normal brain. You know, you you uh, you, uh, you you pointed out. You know, you have to find the money because nobody pays for that, and then you you submit the specimen and comes back saying normal brain. This is this is not no good, and I'm telling you, this is really now accumulating, and there are many people very unhappy with that, and this is uh, so. Uh, so I'm happy to to give you that information. Don't try, don't don't spend money on that, uh, because it's it's it's not it's not the final say. Uh, this this classifier needs to be uh, be uh, further developed, and probably they need some. Uh, some competition that this is uh, the problem. We have only one in the world. It's for free. This is fine, but uh, uh, we have no idea how how it was programmed. What what's the uh, the um, uh, the bioinformatics behind? And uh, I know from uh, from from many people that they are trying to do a similar thing. And we will we will learn. We will learn from this. Uh, but it's not yet. You know, it's it's good for the high grades. It's not so good for the low grades. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. And Dr. Seyla uh, Boskuch from Marmara University. She is a neuropathologist as well. It was a great pleasure to listen to your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumke, she says. Thank you. And Shilan Yıldırım, a fifth year medical student at uh, İzmir Katip Çelebi University. Thank you very much for spending your time uh, on giving us this lecture, Harbulumki. It was a great pleasure to listen to you, she says. 
And uh, we have Dr. Figan Söylemezoğlu with us. Uh, she is great. You showed her <laughs> photo. So she has a comment, but I think we can uh, let her uh, express uh, her uh, comment. Hello, Ingmar. It's, it's Hi, a Figen. pleasure to listen to your talk. And I, I share your uh, uh, all your concerns regarding this classification. Uh, the, the new introduced terminology and the confusion behind this terminology. Uh, as we know, we tried this study, uh, this uh, consensus study, and we faced uh, with the difficulty that those tumors have this ambiguous morphology. And it's uh, even though uh, together we tried to set our uh, morphological uh, parameters together mm. but even uh, when you are on your own on your uh, on the uh, pc in front of your pc it's difficult to uh, interpret the uh, cases with the uh, with the morphology that you have learned and it's really the cases, uh, the glioneuronal tumors are difficult to classify morphologically, but uh, this uh, genetic ge genotyping is uh, created another confusion, I must <laughs> subgrouping, subgrouping. I, I, I uh, totally agree with you that uh, uh, there are most probably there are two tumors, uh, DNTs and gangliogliomas or tumors, let's I don't know their names, but tumors derived with uh, BRAF uh, mutation and with fibroblast growth factor receptor uh, mutated tumors. So maybe it's that simple uh, from genetic point of view, but the morphology is so colorful and uh, this creates another confusion. And um, I'm sure uh, genet genotyping is not that simple as well. So, but uh it's difficult uh, with this new classification you you know that this is a layout tumor uh, belonging to a child with a low uh, low grade tumor with an epilepsy associated tumor but you feel you are forced to have all those molecular studies and to say in order to say something and you you even you feel that it's a low-grade glioneuronal tumor, you can make the diagnosis of glioneuronal tumor. And you, it's, it's, it's, uh, I hope we retire soon uh, without <laughs> facing all these difficulties. It's, it's really created a big confusion. But I'm glad that at least isomorphic glioma is introduced after several, several years uh, into the classification. And uh, it's difficult to uh, make uh, isomorphic glioma diagnosis without showing MIBEL1 alteration. So I don't know. Uh, we will see. We will see in the, in the future. Uh, thank you once, uh, once more, uh, once again. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you and uh, listen to your marvelous talk. Thank you. Thank you, Figen. Very nice. Yeah. I mean, our we we we uh, spent so much time together. You remember well, right? When we when we met in Amsterdam and and so forth, and tried to figure out how to call these these uh, these tumors, give them names, even new names or, or whatever. And we all the group had had a I think found a nice consensus about you know what is important and what is less important. And since these tumors probably grow during brain development. Uh, I think we can probably assume that this is a case. So they interact at certain levels with the surrounding uh, molecular uh, environment. And that probably gives them different morphogenic flavors here and there. So sometimes it's, it's rather more, you know, uh, the, the neuronal part is more, uh, more visible, is more clear clustering and sometimes it's more diffuse I, I fully agree it's it's every of these these tumors is is a challenge 
but if you have seen enough, you understand the, the communality here that, that you do not really look into the, the different sizes or, um, or um, uh, shapes of, of the neuron here and there. You try to understand rather um, the, the atyp at atypical things like, you know, when, when they grow nodular and having spots where, where proliferation is bigger or if they invade into the subarachnoidal space or if they do something else, they, they are composite tumors that they have what I not even touched today, you know, they look like a PXA here and a ganglioglioma there. We had all these tumors in our series at that time. And yeah, all of a sudden, this, uh, these, uh, these, this work was not even recognized by the, uh, by the WHO, right? They, they're now governed by the, uh, by the United States people. They, they discovered everything new the first time they saw it, probably. So we have to wait. But uh, I think we will we will we will go on and and try to uh, try to uh, make the point here. In particular, good to have uh, as many neurosurgeons on our side because they have to uh, to to deal with the patient. They have to understand what's going on. They need a clear a clear diagnosis. And and I think it's not it's not helpful if we have a, a book of diagnosis with without any predictive measure without any clinical description what, what that means. And I hope that that our new surgery colleagues here to this evening are, are with us and, and support us if we are you know, starting to fight back <laughs> to, to make things uh, more clear enough again. And, and you see, we will never have the uh, possibility to do all the molecular measures, not even at my hospital, I cannot do that. So we need surrogate markers. We need something like CD34, P16 and others, just you know, to have a nice description and, and understanding what, what, what, we are, uh, what the genetic profile looks like. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, um, yeah, we we, sorry. Sorry, yeah. with your permission, uh, I want to hear uh, some uh, attendees' uh, thoughts. Uh, first, Madonna Akobatse, and she is a member of our team. She's been online neurosurgery from Georgia, uh, last year uh, resident. And then Hakan Karabalı, Professor Hakan Karabalı, I want to hear his thoughts. And Professor Söyla Boskurt, she has some questions. Maybe yes. she wants to ask by herself. Okay, Madonna, please. Greetings again. First of all, uh, Dr. Blumke, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for the speech. Uh, the presentation was remarkable. The results were truly remarkable. You mentioned like decrease, uh, like they were five year uh, uh, seizure free. Uh, of the patients that is remarkable really uh, and I'm, I need to admit shamefully that the pathomorphology is a real problem in, in Georgia and I, I felt a little bit relieved that we are not the only one struggling with this problem because as neurosurgeons we have to deliver that talk to the parents to the caretakers of the patients because like some of the tests especially methylation profile could not be done in Georgia and the specimen needs to be sent abroad like in Germany and this is not covered by the government and the the the, the charges, the costs in charge are parents and the caretakers. So uh, we are a bit uh, burdened with this as well. So it was uh, really relieving to um, the sheer and the burden with all of you as well. So as to my questions, you mentioned like two mutations uh, with uh, BRAF uh, V600E and uh, FGFR1. So is there a case with P53 mutation uh, or these are or, uh, two major mutations, Matt, in this case? Yeah, that, that's a nice, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. The P53 that, that is well known from the glioma field. Um, yeah, um, honestly, our, uh, we haven't found any P53 mutation in our cohorts yet. So our, what, what I didn't show you, because this, is, uh, this study is not really finished yet, we uh, recently uh, sequenced our, uh, a larger number, I think almost 100 uh, layout, and there was no P53 mutation in there. And, and some of these you know, 
anaplastic variants or however we, we should call them in the future, I don't know. <laughs> but but these are, you know, with, with tumor relapse and, and seizure relapse and even, you know, some kind of a malignant progression, they didn't have this uh, P53 mutation. So, so um, I think it's it's it probably it's too early to to say for sure, but it's it's rather not in the spectrum of the layered. So there are, there are more... probably some other yeah. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> Thank Go you. Ahead. I didn't let it, sorry I didn't let you finish. <laughs> so uh, this uh, I had another question about uh, some of the children with the uh, genetic uh, this is like neurofibromatosis type one often they are at high risk of having leukoglioma. So uh, if you have encountered any such case, if this two disease yeah. overlapped or does it yeah, yeah. made it uh, more difficult to diagnose or. No, if the NF1 gene, the NF1 gene mm -hmm. is, is, is on our list. Uh, we, we figured out, but that was all brain somatic. So our, in our cohort, we haven't had any our NF1 uh, a patient with a, with a germline NF1 mutation. So NF1, not the NF2, but the NF1 gene was, uh, it was uh, I think only one or two cases, but still there are. And that, that's what I tried to answer to Fegan also, you know, when, when we, we start looking into the BRAF is the leading uh, mutation that is also e more easy to recognize, but, but that does not exclude that you may have additional hits that somehow suppress the pathway in a different, in a different way. And, and, and in other words, so if you have more, more hits on the MAP kinase pathway, uh, then probably at some point, these tumors turn into some kind of atypic or anaplastic our, our types. That is our current hypothesis. Let's say your working hypothesis. Uh, it's not. It's not really clearly uh, followed by science. But I think it's. It's gonna. It's. It's. It's. The likelihood is increasing by the day that that we have. Uh, that we have a group of tumors with only one mutation. If you do our, uh, NGS next generation sequencing of the entire exome, you just find one mutation in the BRAF and then you find tumors that have the BRAF, but also something else. Mm -hmm. And that, and in that group, we see most of, of these are adverse outcome patients, you know, where they are not seizure free after surgery or the tumor relapses or even uh, malignities. But but still, the numbers are very very uh, very uh, few, and and it, and it is not not even published yet. So so uh, I'm sorry I cannot disclose more of it. But it's it's I think we should think in these ways. Thank you so much once again. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I think we can get the question from Professor Suila Boskurt. Uh, yeah, uh... She's an orthopologist. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Blimke. It was a very great talk. And uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, sometimes I have some difficulty uh, to differential diagnosis between the focal cortical dysplasia and the ganglioglioma, especially in some uh, small and fragmented biopsies. And at that time, can we use the BRAF V600E mutation uh, to favor the ganglioglioma? Absolutely. I think this is this is one of the first um, the first examples how how this information should enter the the clinical routine and decision making. Um, uh, in our hands, we never saw we never observed the BRAF mutation in in our large cohort of of FCDs that, that we have also sequenced. So the FCDs uh, we have are at least the type twos. We have the uh, the mTOR signaling pathway, and then we have this new entity MOGE. I don't know if you have read about this with yes. the SLC with the uh, galactose transporter mutation, the SLC thirty five A two gene mutation, all all brain somatic. So that is the first gene outside of the mTOR and all the the RAS RAF uh, MAP kinase. So, but there is there is increasing evidence about this kind of genotype-phenotype association. So, so if you have a BRAF mutation, your 
your likelihood is very much on the side of the brain tumor. Maybe it's a, it's, it's a ganglion glioma if it's only the BRAF, if it's even more than the BRAF, may, maybe even with, with adverse, atypic or whatever. And if it's um, mTOR itself or so, or, or um, PIK3A, uh, it's, it's rather the FCD type 2B, or if the, uh, the guard force of that DC5 and, and, and NPLR3, it's uh, rather the FCD type 2A. Uh, and then the MOGA with the SLC. I think these kind of four or five phenotype, phenotype associations, they, they are increasingly recognized and confirmed by independent studies. Uh, however, if you read the literature all the time, you know, there are other papers showing that this is also a different one, uh, and then we don't know what to do with this. But I think uh, the, the, the, the likelihood is you know in medicine you know frequent is frequent rare is rare, so uh, the likelihood is if you have a BRAF mutation, uh, I would you you, you may favor uh, the, the the tumor the ganglion glioma yes definitely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, Aicha, uh, there is a, a pediatric neurosurgeon. Yes. Us today and uh, Professor Hakan Karabalı yes. from uh, Selçuk University, Konya. I'm sure he is seeing some uh, ganglioglioma cases in uh, his daily practice. Uh, I want to hear his thoughts, opinions uh, from a surgical uh, point. Uh, Kamil, thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, doctor. Uh, it was a great uh, lecture. Uh, I am in the uh, surgical side. Uh, I saw uh, interesting ganglioglioma. One of them is intraventricular localization. Oh, okay. Intraventricular uh, localization in the intraventricular ganglioma. Did you see uh, intraventricular ganglioma uh, example? Yeah, I think I, I recognize, or uh, I remember that, that we saw that, but these are usually, let me, I think they have no, uh, they're not really uh, with an epilepsy phenotype usually, right? Yeah. Uh, and we saw, we saw them also in the, uh, in the spinal cord. So, so the ganglioglioma can, can, can grow everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So, uh, but if this uh, grows in the, in the neocortex, uh, yeah. it's highly, uh, high, high, high, uh, very high pro propensity that the patient um, present uh, with a seizure and, and comes to see uh, the uh, the hospital early on. So in the uh, in the interventricular, um, uh, it's it's rather a, a rare. I mean, it's very rare, <laughs> first of oh, all, really? and, and also also the uh, clinical presentation. It's probably when it grows too large that that uh, the cerebrospinal fluid <laughs> is is going to be stopped. Then it's it's all of a sudden it's kind of a you know an emergency. And then they see, oh, how, how could this happen? The same is with the meningioma. You see, we Good. see them from time to time, a meningioma in the ventricles. It's, it's, it's, it's glass, it's clear, it is a meningioma. We don't know how this happens, that these cells can go there and, and survive there and even grow. But, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, rare. That is, is uh, now we know that these tumors can grow everywhere, but the, the, the most likely, uh, uh, uh, occurrence and localization of the ganglion glioma in, in, my, in my clinical experience is the temporal lobe. Uh, and then everything else, even the neocortex, is less frequent. But thank you. Yeah, this is a great observation. So you take out the ganglion glioma and the patient was, was cured? Probably. Yeah, yeah. Mostly right. temporal, temporal lo localization. I operate yes. on, but one of them is intraventricular localization. Uh, uh, Professor Grimke asking uh, if he uh, take up the uh, tumor, intraventricular tumor. And yes, yes, of course. I uh, operated transcortical rod, uh, very large tumor. I uh, remove it. I follow uh, him, uh, but I use the... Uh, uh, antiepileptic uh, drugs because of I used the transcortical way uh, in mm, order okay. to I gave uh, antiepileptic drugs. Yeah, and and it, and the other thing that reminds me what what 
what needs to be checked if, if the uh, the tumor also had a um, a solid component in yeah. the parenchyme. If it's somehow you know exophytic, exophytically uh, growing, and we see this with ganglioglioma. Um, more often on the surface, so so that a part of the tumor enters into the subarachnoidal space, mm -hmm. and this is, for instance, also something that that that we are a little bit cautious about that, that we don't like. Let's see, you know, these tumors are somehow atypic at the on the at the microscopic level, and sometimes they also behave a little bit atypic, uh, uh, so they are not becoming seizure free and so on. But but we don't know what what what the reason is. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. I thank you. So um, many people are expressing their thanks. Dr. Nurullah Kösmene, Dr. Bilge Can, Dr. Pınar Karabağlı, Dr. Özlem Canöz, Dr. Hanan İbrahim, uh, and uh, Hakan Karabağlı also, he expressed his... Uh, thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, do you do any other uh, of our colleagues have uh, comments or questions? I want to ask uh, my last question. So when you publish your paper, will you be giving us a, an algorithm for uh, both diagnosing and predicting the prognosis, the clinical outcome, for example, do check uh, CDK and 2A deletion for these tumors or check something else molecularly or by immunohistochemistry, uh, so with the uh, latest results and when you publish them. <laughs> yeah, we will see. Uh, this is this is always uh, a, a question of time, is it? Um, yeah, we are we are now uh, in the process of, of uh, analyzing all our the NGS data. That that is a lot of a lot of uh, stuff and. Yeah, I would I would say uh, the uh, CDK and 2AB homozygous deletion is always an important uh, parameter. If you could uh, try to establish this in your lab, that that's very helpful. Probably you don't have to wait or uh, to to send out the tissue to somewhere else. You can do fish that's analyses, yeah. um, and and and then because the CDK and 2A, I think is a very strong is a very strong marker for some adverse. Um, behavior of the tumor and and in particular since the uh, pxa is also expressing cd34 we know this for for many years uh, it, it sometimes also have some kind of neuroepithelial phenotype i was always you know struggling with uh, with guido reifenberger who, who studied uh, or who published his study on on PXA with CD34, and I told him at that time, oh, my, my God, Guido, some of your, your cases are coming from my ganglioglioma series. And he said, no, no, no, it was PXA and, and so forth. And it has this CDK and 2A uh, deletion. Um, so yeah, and there are also some, some very recent publications showing these composite um, uh, tumors that, that part of it is PXA by by means of histopathology and genetics and other parts are just next to it are uh, ganglio uh, without the CDK and 2A. And, and still they probably behave total uh, as a uh, PXA, so with the higher the WHO grading. Uh, that, that's all interesting. And uh, I hope we can, we can um, add some interesting papers to that, but uh, that, that is not coming so soon. And I think we have to discuss first with all the WHO people how to solve this problem. Uh, and, and otherwise, you know, the International League would go ahead with some you know, um, extra uh, um, proposals for this until the WHO uh, finds some sense back and, and, and, and think back or that we cannot solve everything with DNA methylation. It's not possible. We don't do that ourselves. Just for research issues, uh, it's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not possible to pay for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all of your comments, your uh, great talk, and uh, we also would like to thank uh, all the contributors in this uh, meeting. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for your uh, comments and contributions. And I would like to give the uh, last uh, the microphone to uh, 
uh, our uh, main uh, uh, organizer uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, the thank you, is yours. The microphone is yours. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Blümke so much, and it was a great lecture and great night for us. I want to give some information about the lecture. Uh, 93 attendees at uh, time. Uh, there was 93. And uh, the discussion section uh, lasted longer than the uh, lecture itself. And it is a, a good indicator of a good lecture, actually. Uh, thank you so much. And I want to thank, thank you, everyone who attended. Thank, thank you. Thank you too for the great, great experience and take care. Hope to see you somewhere soon. Yes, hope to see you. Bye bye. Yep, yep. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a lovely bye. Evening.